Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to another episode of Around the Fire, where just like our ancestors used to sit around the fire to listen to one of their elders tell them about some of their communities, ancient stories and legends, we also sit around a symbolic fire to discuss events in African history. The aim of this podcast is to celebrate the victories of our ancestors try and emulate their successes while also avoiding any errors that they may have made in the course of history. This is what they would have asked us to do if we could ask them now and hear their replies. My name is Letzela Mariri. I come from South Africa and history is my baby. But of course, I'm not alone. I'm chilling with my fellow history buffs. Habari yako, Joan? Mzuri sana. My name is Auma Omolo, just a straightforward East African girl. And of course, sometimes I call you small, and other people yes. call you Joanna. Right. So I am small. I actually like the name Cooper, so we'll change it to Cooper. Asante sana. Abari yako, prof- Professor S. Mzuri sana. Um, I am uh, from the Gulf Coast of the United States. Uh, probably, well, actually voted by CNN as the most African uh, piece of the United States. I'm the pest who <laughs> continuously calls them professor, even after they deny and ask me to cease and desist. So to the audience, so when you hear me doing this to them, uh, it's a bad habit. I mean no harm. And thank you in advance for sitting through my lectures. Class is now in session. Sanda sana. And with that said, habari yenu to you, our listeners. We invite you to sit here with us as we reminisce about those old unforgettable events. Hi, Mariri. How are you doing today? Hello, Cooper. How are you? Joanne? I'm doing... (laughs) Yeah, I'm also doing really, really fine. Yeah. So we'd like to apologize that Professor S will not be available for the meeting today. So just in case that he's the reason you're here. I understand his dark, deep black voice is what would bring you, but today you'll have to bear with us. We promise <laughs> he'll be back next week. <laughs> if he were here, oh, there would be no light. <laughs> <laughs> the light will just go off and the place will become pitch black. Anyway. I know. <laughs> so what is our topic yeah. for today, Mariri? Oh yeah. Uh, so today, as I promised you guys last week, I looked at um, the participation of Igbo women in society, okay. right? Basically, yes, participation in politics, in economics, in other aspects of life in the society mm-hmm. before okay. colonization. So that is before mm-hmm. the arrival of the British settlers or British colonizers in what is today called the Nigeria. Yeah. So the Igbo is a a tribe in Nigeria. I don't know if they are found only in Nigeria, but I know that they are usually associated with Nigeria. Um, If they are found in other places in Africa as well, um, the, the listeners will tell us in the comments. So yeah, I'm I don't looking think at they're uh, found in East Africa though. Maybe in oh, Western yeah, we, Africa. Maybe, maybe in other parts of West Africa, yes. Um yes, yes. so yeah, that's what I will look at. Um <clears throat> basically I'm I'm just looking at the Igbo women, but I found that when I was doing my research, there are some resemblances between what the Igbo society was like before colonization and uh, Mm -hmm. my own society of Babeji, for example, in South Africa, you know, there are, Mm -hmm. there are many similarities and you, you will probably note certain similarities as well between the Luo, your people and the Igbo. If you do note any similarities while we talk about this, you can share that with us as well. I definitely will. Yeah. Or even maybe the Kikuyu or any other tribe in Kenya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Other other people that you know about, you can just know yeah. that hey, that thing, it's there in Kikuyu as well. Right? Yeah. 
Um, <clears throat> yeah, but before we talk about the participation of the Igbo women in society before colonization, we, I, I, I think I should just highlight how the society was configured during that time, right? So um, what was the African society structured like, you know, before, mm -hmm. before Africa was colonized or before that part of the world, which is today Nigeria, became Nigeria, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and to do this, I'm, I'm relying a lot on an author who I believe is an Igbo author as well. Her name is Gloria Chugu, very prolific uh, writer on um, Igbo histories, especially uh, gender issues regarding Igbo women. Um, yeah, people can check her out. She's very good. She's uh, she writes very very informative material on on such topics. Anyway, so it seems that the way the society was structured back then, uh, what historians like to refer to as the pre-colonial era, which means the time before colonization, is that some Igbo people lived under kingdoms, right? And mm -hmm. then yet again, others lived in, I think you would like to call them chiefdoms, right? And yeah. there, were, <laughs> there were others also that lived in what today we would regard as Republican states, right? Mm -hmm. Because in, in, in those kind of places, the, the, the leaders would be elected um, <clears throat> or would be appointed and, th and things like that. So what I'm trying to say is that society or the equal societies then were not uniform. They were not the same. So they were not homogenous societies. They were very diverse. Um, most of their governments were actually very decentralized, right? So power did not lie in one place. Uh, power would be shared among clans, among uh, chiefdoms, among, like there were too many pockets of power. Um, many people had self-rule then, but then again, there were those that lived in, in kingdoms where power would be centralized in the royal family. Um, in the hands of the king and the queen, right? Mm -hmm. So it's important to mention that society was like that, but it's it's very important also to mention that it was very diverse. It was very diverse. So when we think about society, then we must not think that there was one societal structure. There were various and varied societal structures. Right? I think there were there are other societies that had the empires. Yes, that's right. Others were under empires. Um, yeah. Professor Ed talked about the Sokoto Empire last time, which is which is uh, an empire that was in uh, Nigeria as well. Of course, before Nigeria mm -hmm. became Nigeria, because Nigeria becomes Nigeria when it gets colonized and and is turned into one country. Yeah. yeah. But now the question is: in those societies, what was the role of women? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this question is important because, you know, many people, when we think about um, the role of women in African society before colonization, people tend to use today's lens, right, to try to interpret what used to happen then. And that's why you find, you can even find, and Gloria Chugu also talks about this, you can find two extreme positions, right? that are purported today, where some people like to glorify African history and say, no, um, men and women were equal, like everything was level, the playing ground was level, everything was like just hangy dory, it was nice. The women were had the same kind of power, same amount of power that men had before colonization, right? So that's one, that's one side. And the other side mm -hmm. is of people who say, no, it was a, patriarchal society in a toxic way where women have always in African culture been oppressed by men and blah, blah, blah. You know, the kind of theories I'm talking about. Um, yes. But having read, um, um, having done some research and also having read Gloria Chugu, you find that the truth lies somewhere in the middle, right? So that is mm -hmm. African women did have 
power, right? And to participate in society politically, economically, and in other ways as well, right? But it's not mm -hmm. as if the power between men and women then was completely equal. You know, we could say it was equitable, it was egalitarian, um, but it was not like strictly, strictly equal like that, at least in my interpretation, um, given the research that I have found. But would you say there was equity though? Where? Yeah, yeah. yeah I would say there was that, a lot of um, equity, yeah? Yeah, there was. I, I think it is safe to venture that the way society was then, it was configured mm -hmm. by both men and women. Like the, they, they created the society in the way that they wanted it to be. They imagined it to be as men and women, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that for me talks to equity. It's, it's not like one group of people were deciding for the other group. It wasn't like that. Um, and we will find this because I will, I will show you evidence now. But what, what used to happen in most of these societies is, is that they had um, what they call dual sex political systems, right? Dual mm -hmm. sex here being dual gender, two gender political systems, right? Um, but what, what, so what the dual sex political systems really mean is that there, there were roles that women played and there were roles that men played, right? Um, they, 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 they created sort of parallel structures, right? Um, so men would do one thing and women would do the other thing. Um, there was a, a kind of complementary sharing of power. Mm -hmm. And you, um, you will also find that, um, <clears throat> so as, as men, and women together build institutions in society. They, they would be institutions that are run by men and institutions that are run by women. Sometimes those institutions were similar institutions, but one institution would be in charge of women affairs while the other institution would be in charge of, um, I don't want to say male affairs or men's affairs, but it would be in charge of societal affairs, but it would be governed by men. However, there would be an equivalent institution to that. So they, they, they had this tendency of creating um, parallel institutions. So for example, there would be, uh, let me just give you an example. With the courts, um, women had their own courts, for example, right? So cases that involved women were trialed by women, not by men. So men would have their own courts. If, if there was a, a matter that needed, needed to appear before a court, if that matter involved a man, then it would be taken to a men's courts. Uh, but if it involved women, then it would be taken to women's courts. Right, so the courts is just one example of the institutions that I'm talking about, maybe, but there were many such institutions. Maybe that would work in our society today. If you hear all the debates going around about <laughs> abortion and all, and women saying men can't tell them what to do with their bodies. Maybe Thank it you. would really work for our society as it is now. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and I think this is why these societies functioned, you know? Um, yeah. And I think that's why they functioned efficiently when you look at it. And I'm not trying to romanticize history here, but compared to today, I think they, I think they ran their affairs quite efficiently, you know. And and yes, and yeah, I'm, yes, yeah, yeah well, exactly. Like what you are mentioning now is an important example because abortion um, could be considered women's matter, right? So women would be yeah. the best. Place, placed people to decide on that, right? So if yeah. this issue, for example, arose then in the Igbo societies before colonization, then the issue would have been taken to um, women, women. Uh, the women's court or women's councils because 
women had their own councils, right? So like I say, for every institution that existed for men, there would be an equivalent. Uh, it was a society of equivalence, really. There would be an equivalent institution of that same nature, but that takes care of women's affairs, right? Um, I was just mentioning now that women had their own councils. Men had their own councils and women had their own councils. But what is interesting and very beautiful about these councils is that the women's councils had the power to veto any decisions that the men's councils would, would take, right? So for example, if men decided to go to war, if the women's councils decided that there was not going to be a war, they had the power to veto the men's decision and stop the war from happening, you know? Today I was talking to a friend of mine who's Kikuyu. He told mm. me the same. You know, we like to say that the Kikuyu is a very matriarchal society. So he was telling oh. me something like, men could not make decisions on their own. The women were the final decision makers. Like men would That's just right. decide to do something without the women's inputs. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. The Kikuyu yeah. Community, yeah. I see the same thing in the in the Igbo societies is um, is clear that there would not be a decision political or otherwise that the men would just decide on their own that it's going to happen. If if the men met in their own councils and decided this is going to happen, they would have to then after that consult because what used to happen is that the leader of the women's councils was a representative of the women's councils in the men's councils. So when the men met. Uh, to discuss whatever, there would be a representative from the women's side that would be available, would be present in these meetings to relay the women's views on a particular matter. But then she would also go back to report to the women and then the women would tell her if they agree with this or that decision or if they don't agree with it and they, they would send her back to deliver the message to the men, you know? Mm. So that's how it happened. But another way that's, that, yes, sorry. I was saying that's very, very, very interesting. Yeah, I, I found it really interesting. I, I, especially the veto powers, I, I found that because it's like the women's councils acted as checks and balances on the men's um, powers, you, you know what I mean? Like, um, yeah, they, yeah. they were there to check any decision that was been taken about their society. Um, but there were also other, just um, what Gloria refers to as women's provinces, for example, right? So there were aspects of life that were governed strictly by women. Um, one of those is the markets, for example, the trading markets. Um, women were in charge of, of that. Uh, so it's not, there was no markets for men and markets for women. There was a trading market in the society and that was left under the guardianship and control of women uh, specifically, you know. Marilyn, when you say that, um, mm -hmm. I think that hasn't changed much in that if you go to any markets maybe around our area, it is mostly mm -hmm. dominated by women even today, right? Even today, it's mostly dominated by women. Now, who yeah. runs the market? I cannot speak for that, but you will find a lot of women in the markets. Yeah, yeah. Now, imagine that before colonization, we were not talking about like these small markets that we, we see today. Like, mm -hmm. we were talking about like the major market of the community where trade was happening mm -hmm. for the society, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, and that that province of, of, of life was, was run by women. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so that's one aspect. And then another aspect is, for example, agriculture as well. Um, mm -hmm. Women were, were in charge of that. Uh, and I, I saw the remnant of that in my own community as well, growing up because we were still farming then. If, if mm -hmm. you looked at, who did the farming it was it was women you know it's, it's almost yeah. like um i mean we had a farm in my house you know my parents had a farm and i remember mm -hmm. that every decision about that farm was taken by my mother it was my mother who decided 
when we are going to plant and what we are going to plant and so on, right? So it was as if my dad was there just to provide the land, but, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but the person who actually runs the operations is, is, is my mother. So that's just, I mean, I'm using a family as a microcosm of what society seemed to have been like back then, you know what I mean? It's yes. in fact in 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 most of these things when you look, it's almost like the men um were like the chairpersons and the women were the CEOs. You know what I mean? Like when, when you think uh -huh. about a, a company analogy today, because uh -huh. the operational and um executive decisions about the institutions, especially in agriculture and the markets and everything else, it was women who were in charge of those. But it's not as if the men were passive. Obviously, the men knew that we are doing agriculture in this society. We are trading at the markets. We are doing this and this and this. But women are the ones that are, are doing the actual work, you know, and take and making the the executive and and final decisions about how products move and 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 so on and so forth, you know. And uh -huh. another another aspect that gave women power. It, it was um, religion, you know, um, then, because obviously that is before uh, Christianity arrived. Um, okay. The African religions were in the Igbo society, the, most of, of, of the people worshiped goddesses, right? Um, uh -huh. and, and because the deities that they worshiped were female deities or were goddesses, this meant that um, the, the religion was very, can I say feminine? Um, yeah, mm -hmm. something like, you know? And the mediums were, were mostly women, right? And back then, it's not like now. Now, colonization came and it relegated, obviously, our religions to the fringes and to the peripheral parts of, of, of human experience. But then, the religion used to have power because um, the mediums and the, the priests and the priestesses that served these female deities, they, they had enormous power, you know, politically and, and in many other respects, they, they, they had power, you know, and majority of the participants there then were, were women. And I don't know, I mean, in my culture, I have seen that majority of healers are still women even today, you know? Oh, even, I would say even from my culture, um, you'd find that those, the healers were mostly women because they would come with the, they would be taught by their mothers and then you teach mm -hmm. your daughters who'll go ahead and teach their daughters. So being mm -hmm. that it's women who know the herbs, if they don't get daughters or they don't teach other women, then that knowledge dies with them. Mm -hmm. So they would ensure mm -hmm. that it's passed like from my home, my mm -hmm. the last healer we had was my grandmother. Wow. I, I would remember I had I remember I had cramps, and mm -hmm. then she went and picked some herbs for me and boiled them and gave me. And in mm -hmm. a matter of five minutes, I was I was I was not in pain anymore. <laughs> wow. Wow. But now we have to pop some pills. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, because and I know imagine like back then this was the only thing they had you know this was their religion um and now you're talking about medicines you know like the healers and and medicines it's it's and and the medicines by the way they used to be traded at the markets that I talked about earlier right so it was not just the mm -hmm. medicine was one of the commodities that you would go to the market to purchase you know and and it's it's no surprise that the, the 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 purchasing and trade in medicine was happening at the markets because as i said it was women that were in charge of those markets and with the, now talking about religion we also know that they, they they used to have oracles or you know people that were and what is an oracle is it like a messenger in a way right of, yeah of the god or the goddess right and mm -hmm. You know, these oracles, they, the, again, the oracles were women and they had so much power that in some, in some communities, they were the ones that appointed leaders 
you know, because people had mm -hmm. faith um, in in the oracles, you know. Yeah. And now talking about the leaders, I what I, I want to I want to now focus on um, the type of leaders or leaderships that existed for women then, right? Um, mm -hmm. And this again has a striking resemblance with um, a practice in my own culture where the senior and, and those that can speak as a Soto languages will, will know that when we talk about Rahaji or Haji Kholo, you know, is the senior and in the family or even in the clan, right? So this is the person that even in the Igbo society, um, occupied the leadership position in in the in the particular clan, right? Um, but they called they called her the Isi Ada, right? And as I said, the Isi Ada or the senior aunt. I think Isi Ada. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, but I think it's the Igbo word for the senior aunt or the oldest daughter in the lineage, right? Um, mm -hmm. That person, most of the times, was the head of the um, of the political um, uh, or, um, or of the councils that of the women's councils that I referred to. So she would she would be the head of certain political and administrative activities that took place in society. Uh, so in the royal uh, families, for example, uh, she, this 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 uh, the this person would be like, um, I, I can't say she would be like the queen, but she would have like those, those kind of powers. She, she was regarded as the mother of, of the community. Um, mm -hmm. But usually she would have to come from the royal family. So she was, she was a leader by, um, by royal blood. Uh, because again, we, I've already said that back then this is um, um the, the 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 governments were very were very diverse right so in some instances uh some communities were ruled by the the royal uh families right so yeah uh, <clears throat> but then in other instances you could have a woman leader who was not related to the royal family uh, and they called that uh, person the omu um she, she was appointed by the oracle actually but it would be someone who's of outstanding character you know and usually someone who has built wealth uh for herself and 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 the community to choose that okay this is the woman that can head um some of the women's councils that they had you know um i i don't know in in your community do you do you practice the same thing where like the senior aunt in the clan or the family um, has some powers? Because in my in my community, even today, there are certain things that we cannot do unless Rahaji or the senior aunt is present. You have to wait for her because she has to be part of the of the decision making process. Or in fact, she 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 has powers to stop you from doing certain things. You know, in my community, mm. um, your father's sisters are your aunts, yeah. Yes. And your father's mothers are your father. Then your your mother's sisters are your mothers, and your mother's brothers are your uncles. So you know, when you say aunt, that means your aunties were married elsewhere, so they were not really they were not playing such a big role in the society as it was. So probably the ones who are married to your father's brothers who are now your mothers, maybe now they'll be like the older mother, the younger mother would say something like Mama Mkubwa or Mamdogo. Maybe those ones played such roles, but I, I can't speak to that because I'm not really sure. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah, we use yeah. the same descriptions, by the way, for what is an aunt, um, mm. except in, in my in my culture, she she would be married, yes, but she still has to get an invitation to come when oh. certain things happen. Yeah. So she's still no. she's um, like a Mariri, 
and my mm -hmm. aunt is married somewhere else. But when we have something in the Mariri family or in the Mariri clan, the aunts mm -hmm. have to be invited from wherever the clans that they are married at to come back and and help us decide on his situation. You know, in the culture that we have been told is ours, because I'm trying to, I'm, I'm beginning to figure out that that's not exactly what was happening before. The women did not have a say, especially um, like in my home, in our mm. home, my mother has more say than my father's sister. My father's sister has say where she has been married, but that's the culture we have been told is ours. Because, mm. because then again, a lot of this patriarchy and, and toxic masculinity came with colonization from what you're teaching us today. Yes, and maybe I should jump into that. I wanted to give examples of women that became, that were leaders, right, and mention their names, but we don't have time for that. I think we are, we are going to run out of time before we get there. So I will jump into what colonization does. Did. But for those who are interested, there are women like uh, Ogenachi, who was a leader in a, in, a, in, a, in a, between 17th and 18th century in a place called Ezenwani. And she had so much power that she was able to free slaves, uh, to invite, um, to invite, you know, colonial companies when they arrived. You will find that the kind of power that women had is that even when the colonialists arrived, some of them were part of, of the people that signed the treaties with the Europeans to, to get into the Nigerian lands. You know what I mean? And yeah. there, were, there were others like, um, what's her name? Um, uh, Omun Nogboga of a place called Inicha who who also um, was a signatory in 1884 between the British and the... So they, they, even when the Brits arrived, some of these women leaders were part of the processes uh, that either tried to ward off colonization or that uh, had certain agreements with colonizers, colon, uh, colonizers when they arrived, right? But people can go and check that because we don't have time. So I just want to jump in, into now the colonial era when the when when the when the British arrives, right? Now the British have arrived. Now the first thing that the British do, remember, and that that's why it was important for me to mention at the beginning how the society was structured before colonization, because what the British then do when they arrive in Nigeria is they take all these decentralized communities that I have been talking about. They crush the empires that used to exist. They crush the kingdoms. They crush the chiefdoms, and they take every everyone and they lump them together and form what they call Nigeria and they become one Republican state, right? One, one country, right? So mm -hmm. you can see already there's going to be a mess there because that's not mm -hmm. how African society was, was structured, right? So they reconfigure the society in their own way. That's the British, right? But the first thing now that they do is that after having now centralized government into um, colonial government of Nigeria, is then they handpick only men, exclusively 100% only men, to become representatives of the colonial, of the British colony, uh, I mean, of, of the British uh, house in, uh, in, 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 in Nigeria, right? So, and, and remember now, they, they also introduced their own institutions, right, that come with colonization. But for all those institutions, the leaders of those institutions now are these men that are handpicked by the, um, the colonial rulers, right? And I talked about the, 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 the dual structure that existed where women had their own institutions and ran their own institutions. Now those institutions are abolished completely. Um, the, the, the courts, for example, uh, women used to have their own courts. But in 1900s, there's a proclamation that the, the colonial, uh, the British government makes in Nigeria and they establish what they call the natives' courts, right? Mm -hmm. And the leaders of the natives' courts, everyone that works in the court now is a man. Women mm -hmm. are excluded from that completely, right? Um, and as I say, these men are handpicked. So it's not like these are 
these men themselves are appointed by African people or the, the Igbo people, no. They are, they are handpicked by the British government to say, you will work in the courts, you will work in this, you will work in that, right? So you can imagine that those kind of men obviously are already collaborators, right? It's those men that are willing to work with the colonizers, yeah. right? Um, <clears throat> women now are excluded from even land ownership. Now imagine this was a province of women, you know, before colonization, women were in charge of agriculture. What does the colonial government do? They, they introduce the cash crop economy. Um, they, they change the agriculture from the way it was done before they arrived. They introduced their own formats of agriculture and they put that in the hands of men, right? So the people running the farms now are men. Women are, are, are removed from that. Uh, so another thing I talked about- we As Africans are having at the moment with electing female leaders is just something that was driven into our heads yes, during colonization. Definitely. definitely. Um, mm. Yeah, definitely. 